welcome everybody to Oak Grove this morning, and I'm glad to see all of the shining faces that I see. Uh, just wanted to let you know that um, Pastor Steve won't be here this morning, but he is going to give a sermon via uh, satellite or through Facebook, um, and it's due to an exposure, uh, but he hopes to be back next week. Um, so uh, we plan- pray that he will have um, a quick a quarantine time and that he will be able to be back on Sunday. So, um, And I'm going to pray before we get started with the next song. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for bringing us all here safely this morning, and I just pray, Lord, that you will prepare our hearts as we begin to worship, um, and that you will fill us with your joy and our and your um, laughter and being able to praise you for the things that you have done for us um, and the way that you've protected us and kept us safe. And I pray that you will continue to keep those safe that need to be kept safe and, uh, and safe from uh, any disease or issues within their um, life right now. And I just pray, Lord, that you'll be with Pastor Steve and his wife, uh, Pam, that you just protect them and continue to keep them safe while they're at home. And I pray all these things in your name. Amen.
morning. Uh, we could have the children go to the center and uh, play a, pray a blessing on them as Greg Hollenball will lead us. If you want to stretch out your hands. Okay, um, we have offering baskets in the back if you, if you haven't given your offering or you'd like to give your offering. Um, and I'm, uh, I have prayer and praise here this morning. And uh, I found something out this morning that uh, I always have my eyes shut when Pastor Steve's praying this. And, and I thought, man, he, I don't know how he remembers all that, but I found out that he peeps. So... <laughs> So I'm gonna, I'm just gonna, and I don't even know if I can do that. So what I'm gonna do is, is read through some of these things and then have a prayer at the end. So, uh, uh, in the way of pra- praises, uh, I'm gonna do a few of these, but these are at the back. If anybody'd like to take, I'd encourage you to take, take one with you so you can get everything. I'm gonna hit a few of them, but uh, Rowan Woods, uh, the one and a half year old that's had leukemia, and Jackson Longaball has had brain cancer, and they're both in. Re- remission. Um, so that, that's a praise the Lord. Uh, several healings. Billy Worth uh, uh, is recovering from a plane crash, and, and it's, it's kind of a miracle that he is recovering as well as he is. Um, Lorelei Austin is home. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, visitors lately, and we're thankful for that. The playground open house went well, and then uh, Riot J was born to Cheyenne Lawrence, and uh, we had a good congregational meeting. Connie Weston's uh, brother, Jerry, is ill. Lou Saxton's in hospice. Um, and then Sam Gordon, um, many of you had heard that he, he was uh, kind of a hit and run situation. He was walking and was hit by a car. So he's, he's in ICU, so continue to pray for him. Um, healing for all those with the virus. Um, our community ministries, the rescue mission. Uh, for those who are in the service, those expecting, Carol Radke, Mary Sherman, Shana Collier, and Michaela Ray. Um, we have some losses with the Bullock family, Heard Judd family, Wyatt family, and Geodonner family. Um, we pray for our country and our leaders. Uh, uh, we pray for repentance for abortion laws. Pray for a spiritual awakening. Pray for for president, vice president, uh, Congress leaders, Supreme Court, harmony and revival. Pray for the the House, the Senate, the governors. Uh, Pray for Israel and our country's unity. Ministry to those with addictions. Um, And also, uh, we do have a need for for teachers, uh, children's ministry and youth group, uh, men's and ladies' ministry studies, um, creative ministry or media outreaches, uh, Christian Ed, and uh, just pray for uh, New Hope uh, Korean American Church uh, is official. Um, so have those things. So I'll uh, lead us in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you uh, for this day where we can come and worship, Lord. Pray that you be with our country leaders, Lord, and, and this, this list that I've just read. Uh, Lord, and, and uh, I just pray that you would take these offerings and bless them, the work of your kingdom. Um, pray that you would guide and direct. Lord, I, I pray that you'd bless this sermon. Even though Pastor Steve isn't with us, um, he, he, he's going to present this sermon and just uh, bless the words that he has to speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. 
Good morning, Oak Grove, and also our Facebook Live audience. So good to be with you today. I would like to be with you live, but um, this uh, is still great. Uh, I want to have prayer with you. Father in heaven, we uh, come into your presence, and as we begin this new series on the seven churches of Revelation, uh, I would pray, Father, uh, that we would be uh, people of the book, and uh, we would be people of the vision of Christ, and uh, that we would be people who would not lose our first love. And uh, we thank you, Lord, for your love for us, for your care over us. And we ask all of these things, and especially that as uh, Jesus, uh, as Christ, the risen Christ says, that uh, he who has an ear would hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches and that we would listen to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm beginning a new series this week, and I've named it Cherry Pie. And the reason I've named it Cherry Pie is because ingredients uh, are important. I'm not going to go into a big uh, story, but when I was uh, in college, I was sent to a small uh, farming community to preach one Sunday, and somebody told me that I was going home with this couple. And she was blind, but she was a, a tremendous cook. And uh, her husband was bragging on her all the way home, and we got there, and uh, they served this uh, dish, and um, uh, it didn't taste very good. And uh, the fellow said to me, he hadn't taken a bite of his yet, and he said to me, uh, what do you think? And I kind of smiled, and he took a bite, and he looked at his wife, and he said, this is awful. And I wanted to say, you got that right, brother. Well, she was blind, as I told you, and he went to the cupboard, and she had substituted, um, uh, she had substituted uh, bird uh, seed, bird food, for um, uh, for wheat germ, and uh, you could tell the difference. Um, and so, you know, we laugh at that, but the ingredients that you put in is the product that you put out. And when we talk about, you know, cherry pie, what do you expect to be in cherry pie? What well, do you expect cherries to be in cherry pie? Well, when we talk about the church, and the seven churches of the book of Revelation are very, very important, because when we talk about the seven churches of Revelation, they teach uh, the church the pinnacles um, and the pitfalls of those who are in the family of God, the pedestal, and then um, the, uh, uh, the worst and the lowest points of, uh, of the church. 
All kinds of believers read the book of Revelation, and God speaks to us where we are. And as you look at our local church, and here, of course, it's, um, it's Oak Grove Church of God, you must ask, am I a healthy ingredient in the church? Because you cannot expect the church to be more than you are. If you want cherry pie, you got to be a cherry. Now, last week, we uh, finished up a series on the seven sayings, or excuse me, um, the seven I am sayings of Christ. And the last one was, I am the true vine, and you are the branches. In verse 6, uh, said last week, if anyone does not remain in me, he is like a, br a branch that is thrown away and withers. And then it's interesting. You go in the sevens of John, and you go to the book of Revelation, and there are seven churches, and they are being, the book of Revelation is being delivered to them in a, in a circle. And you look, and you see the church at Ephesus, and um, it's a wonderful church, probably one of the larger churches of the New Testament. Paul considered it his home church. Timothy pastored there. And so um, they have some great um, history. And yet he says to them, you have lost, you have left, not lost, you have left your first love. See, when we lose something, we just don't know where we put it. We didn't mean to do something. But when we leave something, we meant to. Now, we might not have been thinking about it, but we made a conscious choice to do something else. Now, when we talk about languishing love, the word languish means to lose energy or lack vitality. And when you talk about energy in, in that, and you talk about love, and we, we, we look back at our, at, our, at our relationships, those of you who are married, you look back at your relationship, and, 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 and you remember um, you know, you woke up in the morning, and if you were like me, you know, we don't have all this texting and everything. A phone call was a really big deal. My wife was uh, in uh, Colorado, and uh, I was in uh, Washington, D.C., and uh, sometimes in Milwaukee in the summers. And, um, you know, that weekly phone call, that's the greatest thing in the world. Greatest thing in the world. And, and you know, you have this love that just, um, just exudes out of you for one another. And then you get married. And, you know, sometimes, you know, you get interested in other things, you have problems, you have um, responsibilities, and you still love each other, but sometimes love languishes. It loses energy and vitality. And so it's very important to realize as we talk about the book uh, of Revelation and the seven churches, and especially um, Ephesus, that we need to make sure that we don't leave our first love, that we are constantly doing what keeps love fresh. And you've got to do that in your marriages, too. And uh, that, this isn't a message on marriage, but you've got to do that. You have to do what keeps your marriage uh, fresh as well. Um, the whole idea of ingredients seems logical. However, many people want their church to be what they are not willing to be themselves. John is on the island of Patmos uh, because of the testimony. We'll talk about that in a moment. Because of the testimony of Jesus Christ, because he has been spreading the gospel. And he's put there, it's kind of a prison uh, island and uh, colony. And he is put there, and he's in the spirit on the Lord's day. I'm not going to talk about, um, go through verse by verse in chapter 1, but he's in the spirit on the Lord's day. And this is where he sees the vision that he writes down. What is interesting is that the Old Testament is, uh, has pictures of what happens in the book of Revelation. And so in, uh, in Revelation chapter 2, which begins the seven, uh, the seven churches and the uh, teachings to the seven churches, the messages to the seven churches, um, he says there in verse 4, I hold this against you. You have forsaken or left your first love. And yet, Israel did the same thing. And Israel is a picture of the people of God. And so, I want to read um, Jeremiah 2, verse 2 and 5. 1, 2, 3. Go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says. I remember the devotion of your youth. 
how as a bride you loved me and followed me through the wilderness, through a land not sown. This is what the Lord says. What fault did your ancestors find in me that they strayed so far from me? They followed worthless idols and became worthless themselves. And that's kind of what um, John uh, is, is, is giving to us, but it's what Christ wants to avoid in the church. John emphasizes that he is put there in response to what is central in Christianity. In uh, Revelation 1.9, it says, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and in kingdom and patient endurance that is ours in Jesus was on the Isle of Patmos because of the word of God, because he believed the scriptures, the Old Testament, and that which was written so far in his day, um, in about... Um, AD 90, he's one of the last books to be written, um, that he says, um, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. The testimony of Jesus Christ. The word for testimony is martyreo, and that can, uh, we get the word martyr from that. And so what he's really saying is, you know, I might be a martyr. Interestingly enough, John is the one of the, of the apostles who didn't die a martyr, martyr. He died of old age waiting to become a martyr, uh, somewhere around 90 uh, years old. But we look here, and I want to talk a little bit uh, about the seven churches and then get into the book uh, or to the um, church at Ephesus. First of all, there is a framework in um, chapter one, and I would encourage you, go home and read chapter one. Uh, uh, for this week, um, for what we're doing uh, uh, today, you know, something to read and say, oh, I see what Pastor Steve had said today. And uh, also for um, next week as well. Um, and the framework is a vision of triumph. It says a revelation or apocalypsis, we get the word apocalypse, of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him, gave him, to show his servants what must soon take place. The servants are us. And soon actually means in short order. When this happens, you know, because people have said, well, it said soon, and we're 2,000 years, you know, removed from that. Um, there are a couple reasons for that. One is, you know, the scriptures uh, say that, you know, with God, um, you know, one day is as a thousand years. Now, that's, that's not an interpretive model um, that, you know, you don't say, well, it's a day or it's two days, so that means 2,000 years. No, that's not it. But what it means is that what we think of as quick and what God thinks of as quick are two different things. The other thing, really, though, is the word traxius, which is the word here for quickly, means uh, in short succession. When this starts, it's going to go fast. And, you know, we, we look at how fast history is moving now, and it kind of gives you a picture like, wow, when did all this stuff happen? So Jesus is unveiled in the gospel. He is presented as the, 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 the lamb in the gospels. In Revelation, he is presented as the lion. In the gospels, he's born as a little baby, vulnerable, transparent, poor, in the book of Revelation, he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the glorified Lord. His eyes spark fire. He has a double-edged sword that comes out of his mouth. His hair is white as snow. His feet are like burnished bronze, and his voice is like the roaring of the oceans, and you realize there's a real difference between the Jesus that was on earth and the Jesus who is now glorified in heaven and waiting uh, to come. He comes the first time in the Gospels. He comes to rule and reign in the second coming. In 1.6, um, it says, And he has made us a kingdom and priest to serve uh, his God and Father. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. John describes a dynamic drawing of the divine deliverer to the seven churches in Revelation 1, uh, uh, 11. It says, 
I, John, verse 9, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours, was on the Isle of Patmos. In verse um, 11, he says, write us on a scroll what you have seen and send it to the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Verse 12, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole vision here because Jesus gives a piece of the vision to every one of the seven churches for a specific uh, reason. Each of the seven churches is addressed with an aspect of this vision of Christ. But this is the framework. The framework is Jesus is about to come, and these seven churches need to know that, and they need to know what they've done right and what they've done wrong and how they can get right and stay right. And that's the same thing today. That's the reason we come to church, isn't it? To know what we've done wrong, what we're doing right, and how to stay right. The unfolding of these events and an outline of the book is seen in Revelation 1, 19. And it says, write therefore what you have seen, and that's the vision of Christ. What is now, that's the seven churches, the church age that we will talk about. And what will take place later, and that's chapters 4 through 21. That's the framework but you need to see that within the framework is the plan of God in his son Jesus Christ who is the lamb who redeems us from our sin and the lion who will come and conquer the earth and set it the way that it was supposed to be. That is the framework. Secondly, there is a format and that's a view from the top. Um, you will notice that I have inspected by number 13. I don't know if you've ever uh, bought a new pair of uh, a new pair of pants and you put, your, uh, you put your hand in a pocket and you feel something and you go, why is there something in a pocket of a new pair of pants? You know, who was wearing these before me? And you pull it out and it's a little strip and it says inspected by number. And, uh, you know, you realize, well, somebody, at least somebody was making sure that, you know, that, uh, you know, there wasn't anything wrong with this pair of pants. Well, that's what Jesus is doing. In the seven churches, Jesus is inspecting them. Um, and uh, each church is addressed in this order, and this is important. Now, now, sometimes in a couple of the churches, one of these is left out. A couple of churches don't have a commendation, and a couple of churches don't have a criticism. But as Jesus, in his glorified state, looks at them, it's a view from the top. And... First of all, there is a picture of Christ. There is Christ. Christ is pictured um, in, uh, in the church at Ephesus. It says, uh, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven lampstands. That's, a pic that's one of the pictures um, of the description of Christ. In Smyrna, he says, these are the words of him who is the first and the last. They need that in Smyrna because they're going through a difficult time. They need to know that they're going to finish this fight on their feet. They need to know that. Ephesus needed to know that God was involved with them. They seemed to be getting along pretty well on their own. And he says, I hold your leaders, the angels. Um, most people think, uh, many of the commentators think that the angels are the lead elder or teacher or pastor. Some people think that they're real angels, you know, and there may be an angel for each church. But Oak Grove may have an angel that watches over us. I've seen enough really great things happen and enough terrible things that could have happened that didn't to, to believe that we have an angel. But um, I wouldn't call myself an angel. The word uh, angelos simply means messenger. So don't say Pastor Steve called himself an angel today. <laughs> my, my wife would take, uh, yeah, she would take... Um, uh, take that up with you, uh, that I'm not an angel. Um, but uh, I think it's important you realize that, that the messenger. And so he, he holds uh, the leaders uh, in his hands, and he walks among the churches. His presence is there. And sometimes we, walk, we operate the church like Jesus isn't around. We do what we want to do. 
And I think that's what Ephesus was beginning to do. And so that's why he gives them that particular vision. And you can go through and you can see that the seven churches each get a picture of this vision. There is Christ. And then there is a commendation. God tells them what they're doing right. Isn't that wonderful to know that you're doing something right? You know, we can always be very critical of the church. And a lot of times when we're being critical of the church, we're being critical of ourselves. You know, sometimes people will say, well, you know, I was sick and no one called me. Well, do you call on folks when they're sick? Kind of an important question, isn't it? So if you're not being what you want the church to be, you know, it probably won't get done. And so very important for us uh, to understand that. But he gives us a commendation. You're doing something good. And then he gives a condemnation or a criticism. He will say, this is where you're falling short. And I think that's important for us to understand. Um, I have pastored four churches. And, and I want you to know that one of the things that I appreciate so much about Oak Grove is that there are times that as elders, we will gather together. And maybe we'll see something that wasn't done right, you know, 50, 60 years ago and say, you know, we really probably need to change that somehow. Or we'll say, you know, we missed the boat on this one. We missed this. And, you know, I, I've appreciated that here because there have been other places that I have been that always seem to defend themselves even if they were in the wrong. And so repentance and being able to turn um, is, is a very good thing. And so there's the criticism. Then there's counsel. He tells us to do something. And then there's a challenge. If you do it, this is what you get. And, you know, we, we get rewarded for, for, for change and for um, following the commands uh, of the Lord. And so um, Christ, co commendation, criticism, counsel, and challenge. Now, I want you to know that these are seven literal churches. This is very important for us. These are seven literal churches that were in the first, church, in the first century. Um, they were in Asia Minor, which is mostly today's Turkey, um, the country of Turkey. Um, most of the, the churches were stamped out in, um, uh, during the, uh, the Muslim uprisings and uh, during, uh, is the, as Islam took shape, it persecuted the church and the church left that area. But um, it's interesting to notice that there are seven churches and uh, they are, um, they, this, this uh, uh, letter, Revelation, is delivered to them in a circular a uh, manner that started with uh, the church at Ephesus. Um, so there are seven literal churches. Now, I also want you to know that any of these churches can exist now as well. The, you can have a Smyrna church, a persecuted church. There are places in our world where the church is persecuted. Uh, you know, I, I can name you some. Uh, Venezuela, uh, Cuba in uh, this hemisphere, China, um, and uh, many, many uh, countries um, that uh, are Islamic republics, they have it in their charter to stamp out uh, both Judaism and uh, Christianity and any other uh, religion as well. But um, you can see that there are, uh, there are churches uh, like that. Um, so any of these churches, these types of churches, can exist now. Um, the lukewarm church, I think, uh, is, is one that we can see, uh, you know, in America. Um, but at the same time, you go to Africa where the gospel is exploding, and they're a Philadelphia church. There is an open door that no one can close. And so these churches can exist um, at, any, at any time um, in, in any period. Now, these churches also may, and I, and I say this because it doesn't say this, uh, in the text, but as I read these seven churches straight through and I read their characteristics, I'm, I'm a church historian. I have a degree in church history. I love church history, and uh, as I look at it, I can see seven periods of time, and um, not everybody buys this, and so I'm not pushing this hard, but I'm just telling you that these churches may represent a, a period of church history where most of the churches in the world exhibited certain characteristics. Uh, and we can see this, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, in certain churches. The church at Smyrna is the persecuted church. And that would um, uh, correlate to the years uh, about 125 A.D. 
to 312 when Christianity was legalized in the Roman Empire. Those years, the church went through terrible persecution. And it may be that God was saying, this is the Smyrna period. I'm not going to push that, but I do want you to know that uh, there are many who believe that. Notice the Lord wants each church to be an overcomer. At the end of each church, it says, um, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, he who overcomes. And then it, it, it gives um, a challenge uh, to each of the churches. And um, so who is an overcomer? Well, in 1 John, the same John that wrote this book of Revelation, wrote 1 John. And in 1 John 5, 4 and 5, it says, For everyone born of God, he's the one in the Gospel of John who wrote about being born again, overcomes or has victory over, it's the word Nico, it's a very popular uh, name, Nick, and a very popular Greek name, for uh, overcomes uh, the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. And then he says, who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, I want to be real careful here, because that word who believes can also be translated, it is a present tense, who is believing that Jesus is the Son of God. It's not just like, well, I said my little prayer, and I got, and I got my ticket to heaven, and I'm gone. No, it's very important for you to realize this is something that keeps growing. We don't want to lose or leave, especially leave, our first love. We want it to continue to grow. We want to be continually believing that Jesus is the solution uh, to, to every problem uh, that we have and that he is the one who is going to wrap up. You know, you look at our world and the mess that we're in, and he's going he's gonna to fix it all. I was listening. Um, I was trying to find something on the radio today, and I found myself on the public broadcasting system, which I normally don't find myself on. And it was really interesting because somebody was talking there about racism. And they said, what will we do when racism is gone? What will it look like? when racism and injustice is gone. And I don't know about you, but I yell at the radio sometimes. Anybody yell at the radio? And I wanted to yell, that's called heaven in the kingdom! I yelled at the radio. Because, you know, they think that they can bring it in by their own power, and they can't. And so it's very, very important uh, to realize um, what's going on here. The one who is believing um, and uh, the question is, are you an overcomer? So now I want to talk to you about the first love, victory over temptation. We've looked at the framework of vision of triumph, that Jesus is going to stand at that last day upon the earth. And uh, the format is a view from the top where he looks at the churches and he, he, uh, uh, we get a picture of Christ. We are commended, we are criticized, we are counseled, and we are challenged. And now we look at the first uh, of the churches, the church at Ephesus. To the angel of the church, the leadership of the church in Ephesus, write. These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven lampstands. They needed to know that, that he was the one who was in charge. Ephesus was a port city. I encourage you to look at the maps in the back of your Bible. They're not there just to keep up space. And uh, if you look up a New Testament map, especially uh, Paul's journeys, they normally have the seven churches uh, that are there, and you can see how it came to Ephesus, and it went around, um, and they delivered the letter to each uh, one of the churches. And each church got to hear what God said about the other church and how they could help each other uh, in, in, in this journey. First of all, the background, Ephesus was a port city. It was a wealthy city. It was a Roman colony given self-rule. A uh, fellow that uh, I had um, studied under for a little bit, Robert Mounts, writes, um, although Ephesus was not the capital of Asia, Pergamum retained this honor, it was a city of great political importance. As a free city, it had been granted by Rome the right of self-government. That, that means they elected their governor instead of him being appointed by Rome. That was a real honor. As a free city, it had been granted Rome, by Rome the 
the uh, right of self-government. It also served as a city in which the Roman governor, on a regular uh, basis, tried important cases and dispensed justice. It boasted a major, boasted a major stadium, marketplace, and theater. Uh, the, the theater was built on the west slope of Mount Pion, overlooking the harbor, and seated up to 25,000 people. They also had a temple there to a goddess, and her name was Diana, and you can read about her in um, Acts 19, when Paul evangelizes that and people begin to throw their idols away, the people that make the idols are mad about it. And they end up having almost a satanic ritual. They, they, they go into, um, you know, almost like a, um, uh, almost like a uh, um, what would you call it, uh, um, hypnotism, like mass hysteria, shouting, great is Diana of the Ephesians. Diana was also known... Um, uh, Diana was Latin, and Artemis uh, was Greek. They were the same uh, goddess, and they were uh, somewhat of a fertility uh, cult uh, as well. It was a wealthy Roman colony. The church was founded by Paul in Acts 19, and God sent revival to this pagan city. It worshipped pagan gods and the regional goddess, as I said, Diana. Her temple at Ephesus was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was four times bigger than the Parthenon. If you've ever been on a tour um, of uh, Greece or tour of the Holy Land, they normally go to Greece first, and then they go to uh, Israel. That's the way that I did it. And uh, it was four times bigger than the Parthenon. And the Parthenon is thought of, you know, as this major thing. And the, um, this major building uh, and series of buildings, and the Temple of Diana was four times bigger uh, than that. Um, Christ holds the leaders of this church in his hand. Um, it's, a, it's a tough place. He said, I know your deeds, your hard work, your perseverance. I know you cannot tolerate wicked men, and you have tested those who claim to be apostles and are not and have found them false. You have persevered. You have stood up under pressure and endured hardships for my name, and you have not grown weary. God knows where they minister. We all minister sometimes in difficult uh, places. We see, first of all, uh, in, this, in this background, um, that uh, Ephesus is, is important. And uh, so people are looking to Ephesus. Uh, are people looking to us? I think sometimes they do. There are churches that people look to, and they have great responsibilities, and Ephesus was one of those. Um, there also is a busyness. Um, you'll notice uh, that... Um, uh, he, he describes them there, and he says, I know your deeds, um, he, he, the, your activity. They were a very, very active church. They were busy. Um, as the church grew beyond the organism stage of Acts 2.42, the church as it began was just people who got together to say, Jesus saved me. That's really all they were. They met in the porticos of the temple. They didn't have a building. They didn't have other things, but they had each other. And Acts 2.42 says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and prayer. And so you have doctrine, fellowship, worship, and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miracles were done by the apostles. This is the organism stage. And I'll be honest with you. I, got, I, I, I came to Jesus. I got saved at the end of the old Jesus people movement. And it was an exciting time. You know, they didn't have a whole lot with buildings. There was preaching outdoors. You know, people would witness on the street, guys with long hair and sandals and the whole bit. But there was something about that that gripped you because there was an excitement uh, in this. Um, as the church grew, the organism, that excitement became more organized. In Acts chapter 6, you remember there is a problem in Jerusalem, and the problem is that uh, the, uh, the widows who uh, were not from Israel, they spoke uh, another language first, and their Hebrew wasn't real good. Um, they, their relatives said, hey, our, our, our old ladies who come for a meal every day, they're not getting as much as the ladies who grew up here. That's not right. And, and it looked like the church was going to have um, this great controversy over, over a fellowship meal, you know, over what we would call social welfare uh, that the church was doing and should do. But what was interesting was, what did they do? They appointed um, deacons. That's where the deacons come from. 
and um, the church becomes more organized. I want to say something to you. It is easy to get more committed to the church sometimes than Christ. That's very important for us to understand. This is connected uh, with continued passionate belief. They had left their first love. They began to be uh, more interested in programs than in the person uh, of Christ. And, and, and that's huge for us to understand that that is uh, what can happen. And so um, as, as we look at this, we realize organization and programming are important, but adoration of his person is indispensable. Now, we have a nice building. There was, uh, uh, we had a little bit of uh, vandalism in our parking lot here the other night, and uh, a very, very uh, nice uh, sheriff's deputy came out uh, to talk to me about it, um, and uh, uh, he said, can I see your church? And I took him around, and he was just, he was, he, he was just, he said, oh, this is wonderful, this is wonderful. I want you to know something, though. You know what? Our church building's been here for a really long time, I think since 1883. But you know what? If something happened, God forbid, if something happened tomorrow and the church building was gone, Oak Grove Church would still be here because it is those who have committed themselves to Jesus Christ and the ministry in this place that are the church. That's really important for us uh, to understand. And so we see, first of all, um, that uh, there was a background, and then there's this, this busyness that seems to have um, gripped them. You'll notice that uh, Christ is pictured as the one who walks among the lampstands, holds the angels. Um, you'll notice that uh, there, the commendation is uh, that um, uh, there are works, there's effort uh, put in. Um, they have rules for purity, um, and they're a separated church. They can't stand evil people. Um, they've pressured false apostles uh, and found that, that their, um, their teaching wasn't true. Uh, they were a persevering church. They had endured. They had not grown weary. Those are all really great things. But in verse 4, he says, Yet I hold this against you. You have left or forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Wow. You know, we might say, oh, well, they're just a little bit off. He calls it a height from which they have fallen. Repent, turn, and do the things you did at first. Love Jesus. Look to Jesus. Get excited about Jesus. Testify about your salvation. Seek the filling of the Holy Spirit. Wow, all of these things. Those are the things that they did at first. Christ tells them to do three things to get them back on track. First of all, remember, they are to recall the freshness of when they first came to Christ. They are to repent. You'll notice that I have a, um, a, a, an old uh, suitcase. My grandmother used to bring a suitcase like that. I loved that suitcase because it always had toys in it <laughs> when she would come to visit us. But you know what? They had packed their bag and moved. They had moved from adoration to organization. They were doing some good things. They, they loved Jesus, but, but Jesus was, wasn't, it, it, it wasn't this, this uh, great, passionate love that they had once had. They were beginning to wither. They were losing vitality. Uh, they were to turn from the urgent to the important. They were to remember when they first came to Christ. They were to repent and turn from the urgent uh, to the important. I have a little book um, that I read almost every, a little booklet that I read almost every uh, new year. It's called The Tyranny of the Urgent. And uh, what it is about is that most things that are urgent aren't important and most things that are important aren't urgent. You know, sometimes we think something's so important and it's just, oh, I got to do this now, you know. And um, the problem is, the important things then get left undone. It's very important to read the Word of God every day. Very, very important. And uh, I've been doing well this year with that. The COVID has helped me, to be really honest. Um, that's very important. It's not urgent. It's not one of those things that you, that you notice. Now, I don't know if you have ever gotten up in the morning and realized that perhaps um, you've forgotten to send your mortgage payment in. That becomes urgent, doesn't it? <laughs> I got to do that now. And, and, and we, you know, skip other things in order to do that. 
it's not all that important. You probably can fix that. But we substitute the urgent for the important. He says, repent. He says, repent. And do the things you did at first. If you don't turn to me, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place. That means the church won't be there anymore. Churches die every day, dear ones. I've actually been to a couple of closing services where a church was having their last service. It's, a, it's, it's, it's really a terribly sad event. But he says, you have this in, fa- in your favor. You hate the practice of the Nicolaitans. And that's the whole point of uh, the, th- the third thing that we need to do is receive. They rejected those who told them only they, the Nicolaitans, could hear God. I think that's really, really important for us uh, to understand um, because uh, Nico means victory and Laos is people, victory over the people. There are always people who will come in and say, now you don't need to read the word of God. We'll tell you what it says and what it means. And there are religious groups that do that. Those are Nicolaitans. And uh, uh, they were to listen, the Ephesians were to listen to the word and the warnings of the Holy Spirit in verse 7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. And I say to you today, focus on the eternal. Focus on eternal life. Focus on what Jesus has done for you and together with others. Remember we talked about the vine and the branches last week. What we do together to uh, evangelize and redeem our community. True overcomers will enjoy eternal life. That's the challenge here. I will give them to him who overcomes. I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. God originally wanted to give Adam and Eve this eternal life. He he never wanted them to leave a paradise. God wants a church made up of overcomers. Are, Are you an ingredient in this overcoming? You will be if you remember if you remember what he, has, uh, what he has done for you. And if you're here today and you say, you know, I have slipped away. I have, you know, made rules more important than my relationship with Jesus. Maybe I've made the programs of the church more important than the person of Christ. If you've done that, he says, remember from where you've fallen. Get back to where you once were. And um, then he says, and repent, turn from from what is uh, urgent to what is important. And my question to you today is, are you an ingredient in the overcoming army? As we talked about the, the, the cherry pie, are you the right ingredient for the right pie that God has? Is Jesus your first love, and is he staying on that throne? That's the question that he asks us today. We want to have a victory over the temptation to set Jesus on the side and run our own show and still say we're a Christian. We want him on the throne telling us what to do. What does he tell us uh, to do? He tells us that we need, uh, we need the word of God. That's what we need. And um, we need Christ in the center of our life. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your love uh, for us. We thank you for all that you have done for us. And I pray, Father, that we would realize that, uh, Lord, you hold us in your hands and you are walking among the lampstand. You're here and you'll tell us uh, where, where to go and, uh, and what to do and how to, uh, and how to do it. And so we love you today, we thank you, and uh, we pray, Father, that um, we would not expect the church to be something other than we ourselves are willing to be. And we ask this in Jesus' name. All of his children said, amen. Good morning, Oak.
like to thank everyone for coming today. If you're a visitor, there are cards uh, behind the front seats there, or the seat in front of you. Um, Pastor Steve and Pam I would like to say hi, and they're doing well. They'll be back with us next Sunday. Um, then uh, Wednesday, there won't be any senior study or Johnson small group, uh, just for safety precautions. And uh, if you don't have a an annual congregation booklet, uh, this is what they look like, and they should be at about any of, of the doors, so you can pick one of those up. Um, next Sunday, October 25th, there'll be a brief fellowship committee meeting in the conference room after second service. They will discuss uh, the December 6th Thanks Christ Dinner. It's coming up really quick here. Um, Remember to give the non-perishable food box for, up, for the upcoming holidays. Um, and if you have any old cell phones, there's a small box in the Narthex, and, and that's for Faith Christian Academy. Uh, they will be sold and refurbished. Um, and take an Operation Christmas Child back and, or box home with you and fill it and bring it back. The table's <clears throat> in the Narthex as well. And um, Kenny Jones. Kenny, do you want to raise your hand and show everybody where you're at? Okay, there'll be... Kenny is the oldest World War II veteran in Whitley County. So I'd personally like to thank you uh, for your service. But you can come and honor Kenny on November 1st uh, at the Oak Grove Church of God Fellowship Hall from 12 to 4. Uh, lunch will be served, and there'll be a basket for cards. Um, Laura Eames has a... We're also doing an 8 by 10 um, Christmas stained glass picture. So starting at 9.30, we'll have coffee and cookies. We'll start working on these at 10, about an hour and a half, and then we'll come back the following Saturday to finish them all up. So there will be sign-up sheets in the bulletin next week if anybody wants to come. And let, let us know so we know how many are coming. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, we're blessed at this church with wonderful pastors, and, and we do have uh, boxes at the Indian Arthex as well uh, where you can give cards and letters of appreciation for our pastors. Um, and then for a prayer emphasis, um, Churches of God uh, Medical Ministries in Mexico, Kenya, and Haiti, Pierre Payan Hospital, and hospitals in Bangladesh and India. Also for the local and national health care workers, nurses, doctors, EMTs, and uh, nursing and medical assistants. Okay, I'll close this in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity that we've had to come and worship this morning. We just thank you for the, the word from Pastor Steve, Lord. I pray that you would give us opportunities and we would look for opportunities to share with others uh, about you and our community. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>